Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. Well, good morning. How are you today? I am. Would li I'd like to welcome those who are online. We're glad that you're with us. We are in a series called Encouraging. When we are in a difficult spot, we all need a word of encouragement. And certainly God gives us plenty of encouragement through his word, through, the, through this, the Bible. As we read, we see God cares about our situation. And if you're in a place where you're experiencing failure or defeat or uh, frustration or difficult place, and you feel overwhelmed, you're not alone. There's been plenty of people that have, go, that have been in that situation and they go to God uh, in that place. Notice Job, the top of your outline. Job says this, he goes, my days have passed. My plans are shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. Maybe that's how you feel. You go, my days have passed. I'm, I'm in a really tough spot. I've failed. I've messed up, and, uh, and I feel overwhelmed. Now, you may not feel that way. Maybe you're saying, hey, I'm doing okay today. I, maybe I don't need this message. But let me just say that no, in life, we go through valleys. We, certainly we have mountaintops, but we go through valleys. Nobody goes through all of life without going through difficult times where they fail, where they make mistakes. And so when we talk about this today, uh, you, I would, if you're not in that place, I would just say, look at it as like prescriptive medi medicine. You know, I'm, if I, I'm, what, do I, what can I do to maybe avoid some hardships? And certainly when I'm in a difficult place, what can I do? to get a fresh start to start over, because God certainly speaks a lot to that. Now, when we look at the book of Proverbs, we see God giving a lot of advice about how, where failure comes from, how to, how to overcome that. I like to read Proverbs every day. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. Of course, uh, in a lot of months, there's 31 months. And so you just kind of line it up, you know, one proverb per day. Per day, it's easy to remember that way. But notice with me, we're going to kind of go through Proverbs a little bit. Look at, first of all, the causes. Uh, and here's the first one. We fail when we don't plan ahead. In other words, you've heard the old saying, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And there's a lot of truth to that. It is important to make sure and plan so that we help avoid things that could have been uh, turned in turned it out differently. Proverbs 27, 12 says, a sensible man or woman, a sensible person, watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. But the simple-minded man never looks and suffers the consequences. So are you, are you a simple-minded person or a sensible person? You know, we all like to say, well, I'm sensible. But when we don't plan, uh, we really fall more into the simple-minded person. And planning is... You know, Stephen Covey talks about the four quadrants. He says the urgent is the, often the enemy of the important. And the important, of course, is that part where we're planning, not having our lives controlled by the urgent. You know, back in the, in the 1920s, when everybody was trying to fly across the Atlantic, and you know, Charles Lindbergh's the one who was the first one, man to fly a solo, first person to fly a solo flight, uh, and he left New York, ended up in Paris, and uh, he navigated that, and, and, and he did it because he planned well. You know, other people had been trying before that, and they weren't able to do it because they didn't, they didn't plan well. Uh, he ended up doing it, the, and then still people wanted to be the first person to return, you know, to go uh, from uh, east to west, and and, and so people were trying that. Here's one person in England, a 62-year-old woman, very wealthy, Lady Anne Seville. She wanted to be in the history books as the first person and the first woman 
to make the, uh, uh, the Atlantic journey. So she hired two people. She hired a captain, Leslie Hamilton, and then the co-pilot was uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Mitchin. And so she comes up the day they're leaving. She's all stylish. She's got this beautiful hat, and she's got an ocelot cur- a co- coat, you know, this fur coat. And it's like she's going to some ball or something instead of, you know, doing. And, she, and she's pushing them because Chamberlain and Levin and some of these people who had, were competing with, with uh, Charles Lindbergh, they were, they were like going any day. So she says, we got to go, we got to go. The captain says, hey, um, this isn't probably, the weather's not good. Uh, they hadn't really calculated the fuel properly. She pushes them and they go anyways. Captain kind of knew something was wrong. He, like all the money she paid him, he gave it to the mechanic, said, hey, it's better that you guys have it than the fishes. So that's not a good sign when the captain's doing that. Anyways, they go, they're seen over Ireland. Uh, they are seen again by a boat, uh, a freighter, about halfway across the Atlantic, and then they're never seen again. See, they didn't plan well. And, you know, they didn't take into factor, you know, the gasoline and the weather and the, the headwinds and all those things. And so they fail. So it's important to plan well. A sensible person plans ahead, the Bible says. An impulsive person, they just, you know, they just, they just push forward and suffer the consequences. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we should make plans counting on God to direct us. Now, certainly if you're a Christ follower, we make plans, but we do it knowing that God's going to direct us. I make plans. I make goals. I set goals for my life. I set goals for the church. And then I, God, and I do it prayerfully. But I also say, God, direct me through this. Because sometimes God wants to move things around. But we certainly count on God to direct us. But we make plans with him in mind. You know, when Noah was making plans to build the ark, was it raining then? No, right? The Bible says it was not raining. So people thought he was stupid. They're thinking, it's not raining. Why are you building this huge ark, this huge boat? They didn't understand the grand scheme and things. Probably Noah didn't figure out half of it. God started revealing to him. It took him 120 years for him and his family to build that, to build that thing. That's, that's some long-range planning there. Jesus tells a story of a guy who uh, builds, he wants to build a tower. He gets halfway into a tower. He cannot finish it because he, he didn't plan well. He didn't have enough resources. That happened to the Washington Monument. You can probably know that story. It got halfway built, and then they ran out of money. And so they had to wait for 20 years. And then they started up, and then they built the Washington Monument. Today, that wouldn't happen. They would just say, well, let's just increase the, the deficit, right? Just borrow more money. That's how, that solves everything nowadays, right? Back then, that's not the way they looked at it. So, so we need to plan so that we don't fail. Number two, we fail because we think we've arrived. We think we've arrived. We think we've got it all together, that we don't need any help, that we don't have to worry. Pride leads to destruction, the Bible says there in Proverbs 18, and arrogance to downfall. The person who gets too, too big for his britches will eventually be exposed in the end. You don't have to laugh. That's fine. I don't care. <laughs> Pride causes problems. The historian James Hornfisher says that in uh, the Pacific during World War II, uh, we, we needed to, to win a key battle. The battle uh, there after Midway is Guadalcanal, the Battle of Guadalcanal. That was kind of like the key battle in, uh, in Normandy, the invasion of Normandy. Everybody looks back and says that was the, that was the that after that invasion, it was just kind of a domino effect from that point on. Well, this was the Battle of Guadalcanal. And... Uh, and yet we were losing that battle. It, was, it, it, it started uh, in, in August of 1942, went all the way into 1943, and, and we're losing that battle. And, and, and the reason was not because, certainly we had lost all the carriers but one. The Enterprise was out, Saratoga was out, uh, and, and all we were left was, was, was one, the Hornet. And, uh, and, and, and that was a problem. You had the Tokyo Express. You had a number of factors, but they say really the reason we were losing was out of arrogance. Americans thought they were better than the Japanese. They thought, hey, we don't have to pra- do target practice. We don't have to do ba- battle readiness. We're going to smoke them. It's no problem. And so over and over again, we kept losing. And so we had lost over 600 aircraft, over 25 warships, 7,500 men had died. 
And it was all because of arrogance. I mean, we had radar, and J Japan didn't have the radar. We didn't even practice with it. They were thinking, oh, well, we don't need to practice it. And then in the time of, of a battle, they thought, well, we don't really know how to use it. So they didn't use their radar. That's a, that's a technological advantage to have radar when somebody else doesn't. And then they would get messages about uh, uh, movement of the enemy, and, and they wouldn't respond to it. In one case, a captain decided to have a big meal and go to sleep. An hour later to wake up in a big battle he was unprepared for, over and over arrogance. And so they removed the admiral because they felt like that was, the, it all went from the top down. Admiral Gromley brought in Admiral Halsey. He came in with this humility, hey, we need to practice. This is not an easy win. This thing could go either way. And so they start practicing, they start working real hard. And, uh, and then, of course, they won that battle and they ended up winning the war, as you know. But it was arrogance that was causing us to not do well, to, to look at, we were looking at approaching failure. Uh, the Bible says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. You see, it's pride that causes us to fail. Most Americans think they're, ab the average American thinks they're above average. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. We think, oh, I'm above average. In fact, the, mo I would say the average person that I've ever met all over the world is, thinks they're above average. So nobody needs advice, nobody, we, we, that's, that's a prideful attitude. So we have to recognize that, hey, there, I can learn from other people, certainly. And there's some things I can, when we do that in our Christian faith, and we think we're above average, we think, well, I don't need anybody. I don't need a small group. You know, I don't need uh, uh, to hang out with, uh, uh, you know, in a men's group or ladies. I don't need that. I just don't need those things. You know, I don't need growth track. I, I can do all this on my own. But if we're going to make a difference, and that's what step four is about. Step four is making a difference with your life. It will involve other people. Pride will keep you from that. Well, I don't need that. I don't need growth track. But it's not, it's, we're looking for people that want to come along, discover our purpose, make a difference for Christ, and we get to do it together. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Many advisors. We need one another. Remember the lesson of the whale. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when you get harpooned. You know? so, okay, well, <laughs> wow. Number three, we fail when we are afraid to take risks. You know, it's somewhat counterintuitive <clears throat> to think, well, why... Of course I'm afraid if I take risks, because that's, I might fail, you know, risks in, in, by its own nature means I could fail. That's true, that's true. But we need to take risks. If you're going to make a difference with your life, it's going to involve risk-taking. If you're, for most of you, you've never taken growth track or something, and you've never taken the time to figure out your purpose and say, how can I make a difference with my life? It's going to involve you doing something different than you're doing today. It means that you're going to go outside your comfort zone. You're going to learn something you don't know today. And so that's taking risk. But there's, it involves, if you're going to make a difference with your life, it's going to involve risk-taking. Proverbs 25, 29 <clears throat> says, Fear of man is a dangerous trap, but to trust in God means safety. So that's one of the things that causes us to not take risks. What will other people think? Will they laugh at me? Will they think I'm less... Of a, you know, that I'm not successful, that I do I have to keep, you know, s s many people, they're more interested in image management than they are character management. You know, what is God doing in my life? How can I make a difference with my life? Abraham Lincoln, he was a great risk taker. He, and, he, and he failed a lot, and he still kept risk taking. He knew he wanted to go into political office, so he, he uh, campaigned a number of times to be in, in different offices. He failed over and over. So m many people would just say, well, Maybe I should just lower my sights. He actually raised his sights. He thought, you know what? I've made all these failures. I'll just try president. <laughs> so he goes and he, and he, does a, a, he calculates the, uh, and does a survey and figures out, hey, I, there's no way I could ever get to become uh, the Republican candidate at the, at, the, at the Republican National Convention. There's no way I have enough votes, enough, enough political uh, power. So he thought, but I might be able to make number two. And if I could get number two and it comes down to just two people, I possibly could get that 
nomination. So that's what he does. He shoots from day one. He thinks, I'm just going to try to be number two. People know that. They know he doesn't have a chance. They know he's going for number two. And through some, a number of political maneuvering and some wisdom on his part and hard work, he ends up getting it. He ends, it comes down to two people going in to the Republican National Convention that year. And then some things happen in the convention, a number of those things outside of his control. And he ends up, as you know, becoming the candidate, the Republican candidate at the National Convention and eventually becomes president of the United States. And it was by risk-taking, even after he had failed. He didn't let that, he didn't let the fear of what people would think or, 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 or any kind of fear hold him back. Fran Tarkinen, he was the quarterback for the Vikings for, uh, in the late 60s and into the 70s. When he retired in 1978, Tarkinen owned every major quarterback record in the NFL. And he said, fear sets you up to be a loser. He said, fear was the greatest thing he had to overcome. And so don't let that happen to you. So the greatest failure really is, the, is just the failure to not even try. I think it'd be great to have on my tombstone just at least he tried. You know, <laughs> you know that's it. Wow, okay. Hey, that's, there's a lot of people that don't even try because they're afraid. They let fear get them. Number four, we fail because we give up too soon. Failure often is just the path of least persistence. We just don't keep going. We, don't, we give up. We throw in the towel too early. And yet we see in Scripture over and over, he says, keep on keeping on, never give up. Proverbs 15, 19 says, a lazy fellow has trouble all through life. If at first you don't succeed, it just means you're normal, right? And you're never a failure until you give up. Thomas, Thomas Edison, you may know his story, great inventor, and he, in, he invented the incandescent light bulb. He had tried 200 different elements that did not work. People said, 200 failures? No, he said, that's 200 things. That, that, those were, that was an education. I now know 200 things that didn't work. Not 200 failures until he finally found the one that did. Just keeping on, being persistent, not giving up. The value of a postage stamp is the ability to stick to one thing until it arrives. All right, you just, that's okay. Whoa, it's not, I actually have some other ones, but I'm moving on, man. Number five. We don't listen to God. And when we do that, it causes us to fail. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. And so there's this leaning into our own selves and our own wisdom, our own knowledge. And then there's leaning into God's wisdom. And God says he has principles in Scripture. He wants to guide us. He wants to He wants to. To, to keep us on a path that will lead us to success. And sometimes, we, you know, we need, we need each other to help with that. You know, often we depend on our feelings to decide what, what we're going to do in life. Oh, I don't feel like that. I don't, but sometimes our feelings are wrong. In fact, our natural inclination sometimes is the exact opposite of what God says. You know, if we need, we, we need to get something, the Bible says if you want to get, you learn to give. And if you want to be, uh, you, you want to be honored for something you do, he says, to be honored, you need to be humble. He says, it's the, it's the opposite. You want greatness? Jesus says, learn to serve. Well, the world does it the opposite, right? That, that's not how you get greatness. But in God's kingdom, he goes, that's how it is. It's almost like, think of whatever your natural inclination is, and the opposite is more like what God wants. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. And so it's the lack of prayer, lack of seeking God's uh, advice, listening to God, that causes us to fail. So regardless of why we fail, regardless of the mistakes and how we end up where we're at, there's some things we can do. And God gives us some advice. Here's what, if you're in a place where you need to, st you need to start over, you need, a, you need a, a reboot, you're in a place of defeat, you need, you need something, you need God's help in your life. Here's some things we can do. Number one, accept responsibility for your own failure. Sometimes it is our responsibility. Sometimes we played a big part in it, or any part, and we accept that. Proverbs 28, 13 says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful, but if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. So circle like gets another chance. This is the person who makes a mistake, and instead of falling in and saying, I blew it, Woe is me, I'm so sad, and blaming other people, 
we, he says, we get another chance when we just admit it. We're, we're actually experts at passing the buck, most of us. I mean, it came down from Adam, Adam and he, Adam sinned, and when God confronts him, he goes, well, it's my wife. You know, he just passed the buck. And some things never change, right? It's still happening today. <laughs> yep, it's, the, it's my spouse that you gave me. Thanks for nothing, you know. <laughs> and we just passed the buck. We're, we're really good at that. John Dillinger, he was the American gangster back in the Depression era. I mean, he, this guy was a, a thug. I mean, he, just, he was a murderer. He, he would just gun people down for no reason. Some, some guy came up and just asked him a question. He gunned him down because he didn't like him. He, he robbed 24 banks, four different police stations. That's, that's a lot of bravado, right? Just rob a police station because he wanted the cocaine and all the stuff in the back. And so anyways, they finally surround him. He's in a hotel room. He knows it's his, it's, it's his last stand. So he, he decides to write a letter. So he writes a letter, and he starts to say why he is the way he is. And he goes, I'm really a nice person. I'm kind and loving. He goes, it's the world that made me the way I am. Now listen, we look at that and we go, that's, you know, you made some of your own choices, right? Gunning people down and just asking. But we, we all have a tendency to do that. Blame other people or other things. I mean, there's, we can blame it on we got bad luck, on fate. We bl blame it on astrology. We blame it on the weather, on the economy, on our parents, on our kids. I mean, there's, there's, there's always something you can blame the way you are on someone else. But listen, that gets you stuck right where you're at. You can actually choose to say, I'm going to respond differently. I mean, there's some things we can't choose what comes our way. But everybody, so everyone in this room, everyone online, we all have something in, in common. Hardship does come. We have difficulties. And so we have failures. Sometimes it's other people, but how we respond, we need to admit it. Say, hey, listen, this is, this is on me, and I'm not going to fall into that spot. 1974, after an 88-game winning streak, UCLA loses to Notre Dame. They were actually up by 11. They end up losing. The next day in the newspaper, you have John Wooten saying, he, he says this phrase, he goes, blame me. Now, that's the mark of a winner. He didn't, I'm sure he had plenty of people he could blame. Oh, yeah, so-and-so didn't do that. I told him not to do that. He said, blame me. He says, we got overconfident, and that comes from me. Mark of a winner. Number two, stop regretting and start repenting. When you have a major failure, you, you don't get stuck there. You start repenting. Now, Jesus uses that word quite a bit. He says, repent, repent. Now, the word means to change your mind. That's what it means. Repent means to change your mind or change your behavior. Because when your mind's changed, then you start to change the way you act. Change, it change your heart. It's, it, you change the way you're going about doing things. You were doing things this way. Now you're going to do things this way. That's what it means. So you stop regretting. You start repenting. You say, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to be different. I'm going to do things different. And that's one of the points of measurement. How do I know if I'm just, if I've moved from, from, from just regretting to repenting? Well, I start to change. I don't, you know, you might feel, hey, God's just, you know, I've, I've messed up, so I'm going to be left on a shelf. God can't use me. No, when you start, when you repent, that means you're allowing God to use you. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says the sadness. No, no, let's read this together. Ready? Everybody together. The sadness that is used by God brings a change of heart that leads to salvation. And there is no regret in that. But worldly sadness causes death. So here he's talking about sadness, right? We all have sadness. You, when you're in failure, when you, when, you're, when you have defeat, sadness comes with that. But here he says that there's, he calls it, God, there's a godly sadness. He says, when you're in godly sadness, he says, God brings a change of heart. That's what we're talking about repenting. He goes, that's, that's an indication of, of God at work in your life. You have a change of heart. And he says, that leads to salvation. He goes, there's no regret. So we don't have to regret. We repent. We have that change of heart. Now, friend, when you have something that causes you to be sad, it always starts with worldly. I mean, it's, it's, you go, how do I know the difference? Well, it always starts with, I'm just sad. Ugh. But when you give it to God, then it becomes godly sorrow. So you, you actually transfer it and you change it from just worldly sorrow, which just brings 
death and discouragement and nothing good, if, if you, and when we give it to God, it changes us. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. God does some great things in our lives. When we use godly sorrow, it motivates us to change. When we're caught up in worldly sorrow, we just put on a pity party, right? Just, oh, woe is me. Pity. And when you throw a pity party, that's a sad party. Nobody comes except the devil. It's just you and him. He's, he's there to just make you feel worse if you didn't feel bad already. So godly sorrow. I mean, look at Peter and you look at Judas. Totally different the way that they approach that. And in Proverbs, uh, we'll look at them in just a moment. Proverbs 20, verse 30 says, Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. You know, sometimes... Sometimes we do need pain. Doesn't mean we have to fall into worldly sorrow. But sometimes we need pain in our lives. My mom told me when I was a kid, she goes, now don't put your fingers in the egg beater. And she went off to do something. I thought, I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> so I mean, I had to just jam it in there. I was trying to slow it down. And then the motor won and my fingers got caught in there and I'm yelling. My mom, uh, we just had this discussion. <laughs> really, what I was saying is, is hmm, I learn better by pain. Now, listen, <laughs> you don't have to say that. You don't have to be that person. You can say, I'm going to learn through instruction. God has guidance for me. I don't. Just, Samson, if you know his story, he was somebody who just learned better by pain. His, he was raised in a good home. God. He, he was godly parents, and they gave him good instruction. But he's out now. You know, they said, hey, this is the kind of person you should marry. No, I'm marrying whoever I want. And then he ended up going through a couple spouses. Those things were real painful for him. His own people turn on him because of some poor decisions he makes and how he ignores godly counsel again. He, actually, he ends up with his eyes gouged out by the Philistines. They gouge out his eyes, and then he goes, you know what? I'm ready to learn. Now, you can wait that long. I stopped at the egg beater. I didn't want to wait for my eyes. You know, I just thought, you know, but there's like no limit to the pain if you're not, if, you're, if that's how you learn. But certainly that is one of the ways that we learn. Paul experienced a fair amount of pain. Paul, you know, he, he was blinded for three days. He was persecuting the church. God reached out to him and then to kind of give him a time of soul searching. He was blinded for three days. He was healed. But then his path, of serving God, how he was going to make a difference, involved some challenges, a lot of traveling. It involved uh, him, his motives being questioned all the time because his gospel to the Gentiles looked so much different than the gospel that Peter and James were speaking to the, to the Christians in Jerusalem. It was difficult. He surrounded himself with 14 men to support him. He didn't do it on his own. We don't see Paul ever. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. He never bragged, yeah, I do this on my own, man. Look at me. No. In his letters, over and over, he lists, hey, remember, these guys were there with me. They're here with me now. They're standing with me. You're wondering, who are those guys? Well, maybe you weren't, but I'm going to tell you. Okay, here they are. Barnabas, John, Mark, Silas, Timothy, Luke, Epaphroditus, Onesimus, Trophimus, Tychicus, Sopater, Secundus, and then those three guys that didn't really travel with him, but they were there in key spots when he was there, was Erastus, Aristarchus, and Gaius. Fourteen guys that Paul lists. M many of them over and over again, they were there with him. He says, I need other people to do this race. I can't do it on my own. There's no Lone Ranger. I mean, even Lone Ranger had Tonto, right? <laughs> no. But we need more people. January 13th and 14th of this year, we did an altar survey. We do it every year or every other year, altar survey. We waited. We were going to do it the 6th and the 7th, but it snowed real bad, remember that? So we pushed it. And one of the questions we asked was, do you have a close friend at Vineyard? I think that's an important question. That's why we ask it. Do you have a close friend, or one, or one or more? Here's what the response was. One-third said yes. Two-thirds said no. Two-thirds. Now, certainly there's some visitors that day, but not two-thirds. Two-thirds, which means most of you. Say, no, I don't have a close friend here at the church. 
Well, I, I, that's not God's best. I can tell you straight up, that is not God's best for you. God wants companions to walk with you. And as you discover your purpose, as you find freedom, as you e explore your Christian faith, as you make a difference in life, you're to do that with other people, with, especially with men. You know, men, I, I'm glad for the ladies' retreat. You know, there's 100 women there. They're, they're, they're connecting. There's some good relationships happening there. But I'll bet this, the, and I'm, I'm thinking of, re, there's ways of, of uh, recomputing that to see how it, who's that affecting. All I know is, is that it's two-thirds at this point. Two-thirds don't have a good friend. But I wonder if, 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 w if, how, if we took women out of that, because we can rerun that and see how many of that were women. I bet it might be even a higher percentage among men. Men often tend to think, you know, the, the, down deep, I'm a guy, I know. Down deep, we want, we, we have a lot of guy friends when we're young. As we get older, we don't have as many. We long for that. It's just, it's hard. It's hard. And so it does take some initiative. That's why we're trying to make it easy for like a men's event. Not even a whole retreat. It's one night, three hours, come. We're going to stuff your stomach full with amazing protein foods and we're going to have a lot of games, a lot of fun. You can come to that. That's a stepping stone. Yeah, could you do something else? Well, not a whole lot. Fo it's not football season yet, right? So, but you can come to that and be part of that. Man, it's, we need one another. We really do. We need one another. And God will, I believe God has that as a way to help us move forward. Number three, forget the former and focus on the future. Philippians 3 says, forgetting, so there's forgetting the former, forgetting what is behind, now here's the focus on the future, and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we don't let our defeats defeat us. Now Paul had made a lot of poor decisions especially before he was a Christ follower. I mean, he's out persecuting the church, hunting them down. He holds the coats of people that are stoning the first Martin, the, the first martyr. You know, Stephen is, is martyred, and he, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Bad, and he could have let that stuff just eat at him, eat at him, and, and, and just swallowed up. Those are bad memories for him. He, he talks about them later on. They're bad memories. But listen, he didn't let it control him. L let me ask you, what memories do you have? Are you letting manipulate you today? Memories of stuff. You're thinking, wow, I wish that hadn't happened. You know, I regret that. And it's, you're letting, see, and he says, no, I'm not going to let the former stuff allow to impact the thing of my future. I mentioned uh, Peter and Judas. Peter and Jesus, how they approached godly sorrow, how they're approaching moving forward. And so Peter and Judas, here they're both disciples. They both deny Christ, right? And they both are disappointed. They both have sorrow. The, we, we see Peter he, on the night that Jesus is going to be betrayed and tried and crucified, Jesus actually predicts and says, you know what, before the rooster crows, uh, you're going to deny me three times. He goes, no, 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 that's not me. In fact, all these guys here could deny you and not be there for you. I'm going to be there for you. And then, of course, if you know the story, that's exactly what Jesus, what he said happens, that, that people come up to him while Jesus is being tried, and they say, hey, aren't you associated with Jesus? He goes, no, I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. The last time he even curses, I swear to you, I don't know the guy. Then the rooster crows, and he realizes, wow, Jesus saw this in advance. He goes out, and the Bible says he wept bitterly. That remorse, that he had godly sorrow. But at the time, it was just sorrow. He's thinking, God could never use me again. You know, I'm, look at what I did. And so when Jesus is raised from the dead, and Mary comes he says, go tell the disciples and Peter, he singles Peter out, that I've been raised from the dead. Why would he raise single, raise, single out uh, Peter? It's because Peter needed more encouragement because of what he had gone through and what he had done. He knew Peter was thinking, man, I'm, maybe the other disciples will be used, but I'm, that's it. God will never use me for what I did. 
He goes, no, tell Peter. I've been raised from the dead. It's a different day. For Peter, he responded differently. Now, Judas, he denied Jesus. He was a disciple. But in his regret, in his worldly sorrow, he just commits suicide. That's what Judas does. And that's where worldly sorrow leads. Just a death. Nothing good comes of that. When we give it to God, God does something in our life. God redeems it. God raises the dead. You know, Peter, just 50 days later from the event of him denying Christ, just a little over 50 days, he ends up preaching Christ and 3,000 people make commitments to Jesus Christ. 3,000 people. This is the same guy who just denied him just 50 days earlier because God redeemed him. He said, I'm not going to focus on the former. I'm going to move in what God has for me in the future. And so he approached it with with godly sorrow, which is what we need to do. We need to recognize that God's not done with us. We might think he is, but God can still do something. Number four, trust God to work it all out. Trust God to work it all out. So we accept responsibility for my failure. I stop regretting, start repenting, forget the former, focus on the future. And then I trust God to work it all out. Love this verse here. He says in Romans 8, 28, we know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. So circle the word pattern. There's a pattern that God is weaving in your life. And when you have a piece of tapestry, you have both light and dark colors. And we have good times and we have difficult times in our life that are darker, that are harder. In fact, if you look at a piece of embroidery, if you look at the bottom side of an embroidery or needlework, you'll see it's just all strings and, and knots and it, make, it doesn't, you can't see anything of value in it. But if you look at the top side, you see, you see something beautiful happen, right? God can take something that looks to have no value, a failure in our life, and make something beautiful out of it. He does that. He's an expert at that. We, we, we don't see it happening, but, it, but it's going on. In fact, Isaiah says he makes beauty from ashes. Only God can do that. I mean, certainly there's things we can do to help you know, we read books, we get counseling, I'm all for all that, I've done that, but we need God. We need God to take the ashes and make something beautiful from it, and that's what he does. That he's, he's, he's good at that. I used to worry about how my problems got in my life. How did I end up with these, these failures and these, these things? And you can learn from that, but really in the end, I, I've learned over years, it doesn't really matter if it's if it's somebody else, you know, maybe a Christian, you know, uh, hurt me and I have this problem now or, a, or, or, a, or somebody else or it's my own fault or the devil did it. I mean, it doesn't really matter. God can use all of my failures, all of the things that would cause me to regret. He can use them all. I've got to be willing to bring them to him, though. Say, God, you, you make something beautiful out of this because I certainly cannot... If you look at the heroes in the Bible, in uh, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, the heroes of the faith. You just have all these lists of names. of These are the heroes. And yet you see one after another, if you know their story, they're adulterers, they're murderers, they're liars, there's cheats, they're swindlers, they're people that uh, were, 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 uh, had zero conv conviction about things. You say, well, those are the heroes? Yeah. Those are who God uses because when we make ourselves available, see, often we just say, well, God will use somebody else. He can't use me. But God uses those people. He uses everybody. He uses the people that say he's not as much interested in where you've been as much as where you're willing to go. Not where you've been, but where you're headed. And if you say, God, I'm willing to let you work in my life. Use whatever I, whatever I have. I'm, I, I want to make a difference for you. God will use that. He starts over. I, Moses, you know, his greatest weakness was anger. I mean, he's always exploding. He kills an Egyptian. He takes the tablets of the Ten Commandments and smashes those. He takes his rod and smashes a rock when he was told not to. And he's got all this extreme anger always. And it caused him to not go into the promised land. But by the end of his story, 
the Bible says God had made him the meekest man on earth. The very weakness he had, God had used and made a strength in his life. And this is what happens when we take our weaknesses, our failures, our mistakes, we give those to God. He builds on those like nobody else, and he makes those things strengths. And it gives him glory. We want God to use our strengths. God, use my strengths. Look at all these great things. No, he goes, I want to actually use your weaknesses. And I'll build on those because when I do that, that will show that God is at work in your life. Let me close with this last verse. It's a verse about getting a fresh start when you're in a difficult spot, when you're, when you're tempted to fall into regretting and a self-pity party. Here's what he says. He says, for a man or a woman is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Boy, that's a great verse. It's finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. How does God do that? Well, he, he does it through his grace, the power of his grace. When you let Christ into your life, you'll see God is at work in a powerful way. When I let Christ into my life, I asked Christ into my life August 28th, 1981. And from that day forward, I saw God's grace came in and freed me from some addictions that I had. I didn't do anything. I don't even remember praying about it. He just freed me. God's power, at least. And some things I needed to walk through. So, so not every addiction, some addictions. Some addictions, it's been years of just bringing those to God, letting God heal me, but God's at work. And it gives me this fresh start and, and the guilt and all of the pain, all those things that really would have been predictors about, about my life. My grandmother had been married and divorced seven times. My dad, three times. I mean, and I guarantee, I'm telling you right now, I would have been, I would have been divorced if it hadn't been for Christ. I've been married 29 years, but it's, there's been some, some, some times when if it wasn't for Christ, now you might, that might make you feel uncomfortable because you want your pastor to be better than that. Oh, you know, oh no, I want to have this image that everything's good for you. I'm going through hell, but everything's good for you. No, that's not how it works. We all have troubles. We all have difficulties. And God's grace makes things new. And our, the devil will say, you've wasted your life. You've wasted that part of your life. But listen, that is the devil because God doesn't see it that way. God takes things that look like trash, look like they have no value, and he makes something beautiful from it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Heavenly Father, I pray for those here today who are, I mean, you're just in a tender place. That's all there is to it. You're in, a, you're in a tough place. Those of you who are online, you're saying, man, if, if God doesn't reach out to me, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Now here, the good news is God has already reached out through Christ. And he's here today. Jesus Christ is alive today. We serve a living God. And he reaches out and he wants to do some repair work. He wants to do some healing. He wants to, his grace will bring freedom. It'll bring hope where you don't see that. Maybe you're looking at some hardships in your life. Maybe it's your physical health. Maybe you feel like you've added to the problem in some of your relational stuff that's going on. You've been hurt by somebody, maybe in school or at work, you're having problems there. Maybe with your finances. And, it, and the devil would want to get you into a pity party. Would want you to stay in worldly sorrow. But this is not how God's grace works. God wants to lead you out of that. He wants to inject hope, fresh vision, resource you, bless you. This is his promise. This is what God does. And so today I'm going to ask you to just lean into God right now. Right now where you're at, wherever you're at, in your mind, in your, in your heart. If you're online, you just right where you're at. You just, God says, to first admit it always begins with that. 
We enter into the kingdom of heaven through humility. Say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for the things I've done to veer off, to not heed your guidance. Then would you say, God, help me to not fall into regret, but to have a change of mind, a change of heart. That begins with you right now. Right now, only you can decide if you're going to do that. You say, God, right in your own heart, you say, God, I change my mind. Today, I want to put my faith in you. I want to trust in your scriptures, trust in your holiness, that you will guide me and you will heal me. Then when you say, God, help me to not let past memories manipulate me today. Free me from that. Say, God, no matter what, No matter what troubles I find myself in, it doesn't matter how they got here, but you can use it. And now just give God permission. Say, God, I give you permission to use the painful things in my life. Build on those. Take my weaknesses and make them strengths. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.